thank you very much uh, to Shannon and for the entire team for putting this amazing, inspiring day together. It's been, uh, it's been quite uh, incredible already, and I'm, uh, I'm honored to be taking part in this inaugural uh, TEDx event in Powell River um, because I'm very proud of my family's 35-year connection to this part of the coast and uh, in extension to the communities of Powell River and to Lund and to Desolation Sound. Uh, there's a, a great shot of Desolation Sound. Uh, talk about spring that was taken on uh, Sunday, last Sunday. <laughs> pretty, not this Sunday, <laughs> but pretty amazing, uh, spectacular weather. That's uh, the peak of uh, Mount Denman uh, in the back, and that is the tranquil, reflective waters of uh, Prito Haven in uh, Desolation Sound. And uh, as Shannon mentioned, uh, the subtitle of this TED Talk is The Story Nobody Wanted to Hear. And I'm going to tell you why. Uh, my book is about Desolation Sound, my favorite place on Earth. Uh, has anyone here been to Desolation Sound? <laughs> OK, that's more than at my book reading in Regina. So that's good. <laughs> Uh, and uh, the first time that I ever saw Desolation Sound was uh, through the dirty window of my dad's bucket of bolt seaplane that he would fly around the province and look for a land to buy and possibly develop. And I didn't see much of this gorgeous place because I was about six years old at the time and I was wearing very thick Coke bottle glasses and I had my head between my knees and I was... Uh, both crying and violently vomiting <laughs> from the uh, seaplane ride because my dad would fly it along with deafening volume in this, inside the seaplane. We'd fly along, we'd hit an air pocket, and the plane would just drop like an elevator with its cable cut, and I would vomit uh, onto the inside of the, the windshield, and my dad would go like that, and then he'd <laughs> shout reassuring phrases, which I couldn't hear, and he, as he'd pull back up, and he'd tilt the plane from side to side so he could snap photos like this <laughs> of beautiful desolation sound. Uh, this waterway over on the left-hand side, uh, that's Grace Harbor, uh, which is the traditional village site of the First Nations where thousands and thousands, hundreds and, uh, of, and up to thousands of uh, tribes would gather in uh, the winter place, the traditional name being uh, Kakeke. And we were a fairly conservative uh, family um, from West Vancouver, BC, and we slowly constructed a cabin over the years, and uh, that's what it eventually ended up looking like. That's uh, my larger-than-life father with uh, the cabin finally completed. And uh, we, we went through kind of a daily culture shock uh, in Desolation Sound when we crossed paths with the locals. Uh, this was in the late 70s and early 80s, and uh, so the locals were a combination. It hasn't quite really changed all that much. Uh, loggers, oyster farmers, draft dodgers, First Nations, uh, outlaw bikers, um, naked hippies, and uh, basically generally people that kind of look like, and I, I mean no offense, uh, look like kind of a cross between... Um, uh, Willie Nelson and um, the Manson family, let's say, and uh, like, like this fellow. Uh, this is uh, the great, the legendary Russell Latosky, the philosopher of Desolation Sound. Uh, he crossed those coastal mountains behind him on foot to make it uh, down to Desolation Sound, where he decided to squat right beside our cabin for over 10 years in the bush with no electricity whatsoever, just a, a little CBC radio that ran on batteries and uh, a big greasy rifle and a couple of friendly dogs. And uh, Russell became a great mentor to me and my wife and I, oh, I gotta, <laughs> I don't wanna get choked up. We uh, just visited him yesterday on Gifford Road and he's doing well. And uh, we also spent a lot of time here. Anybody know what that is? Uh, that is the Cougar Ladies' Cabin, uh, Nancy Crowther, on uh, Crowther Road. It is now the home of uh, Powell River Sea Kayak, and they're lovingly restoring the cabin. That cabin is um, circa around 1920, and it's a lovely log cabin that is still there 
to this day. But now, you think this would be a, a, some, a paradise, right? Well, I wasn't into it when I was a little kid. I much preferred the city. And uh, when I got old enough to just say to my parents, I refused to go, uh, I got out of there and I joined a rock band. Oh, there's me and Russell fishing. I forgot about that one. Um, but I joined a rock band called The Smugglers. Uh, I know you're all fans. Thank you for remembering, <laughs> for remembering all our hits. And uh, eventually our band wound down. Uh, the, the, the beer bottles ran dry. And uh, I, I was convinced to return to Desolation Sound, this place that I had kind of forsaken. Uh, and I went very reluctantly. And I, I was shocked. I remember rolling down Malaspina Road and uh, the trees parted like, uh, like a, a curtain in a movie theater. And what I saw before me uh, choked me up because it was this... It was a beautiful sunny day, and it was this sparkling, oceanic nature supreme. And the, the smells, as they often do for us, uh, sparked my memory of all those summers past when I was a nervous little kid. The smell of uh, seaweed and salt air and the tar on the dock pilings and, and the gasoline in the boats. And I became uh, rather emotional, and it was so green and so blue and so raw and so alive and I, I fell in love with it and I fell in love with the cabin and the environment and most importantly I fell in love with the people and the stories and I loved soaking up the stories by this point I had been working at CBC and I was kind of trained to, to keep my ears open for stories and I couldn't believe the stories that existed in this place from my kooky neighbors and all their strange habits to the deep, rich, fascinating, exciting history of the First Nation civilizations that existed in Desolation Sound that so few people seem to know about or care about. The pioneer stories that were death-defying and exciting and gun-blazing. There, were, there was a member of the Jesse James gang that lived in Desolation Sound hiding out. And then there was the counterculture of the 1960s and 70s, the communes and the draft dodgers. It all fascinated me. And that's when I became a summer correspondent for CBC Radio, and I would report from Desolation Sound telling these stories on a weekly basis to hosts you all know and love, like Bill Richardson and Sheila Rogers and Gian Gomeshi. Gian was the city mouse, I was the country mouse. And I often tell them from uh, sitting right there, and there's the CBC sweater. And I did this for three or four summers straight on Radio 1, and this was nationally, this was right across the country. And the stories were really well received. And one day a producer at CBC said, you know, you should, these stories are really neat, great stories. You should write them down because on radio it's fleeting, it, it disappears. You should publish these stories, it could last forever. And then he said something really inspiring to me. He said, you know, don't, don't, I, I said, I'm not really a writer. And he said, don't be a writer, be a storyteller. Tell your stories in the written form because everyone loves a great story. Or so I thought, he kind of propped me up there. So I took the advice, and I sat down, and I started writing, and it was very hard. My stories were three-minute radio stories, and all of a sudden, there's this large book format in front of me. But early on in the writing process, I heard a phrase that I love sharing, and I want to share it with you now. It's um, from, as far as I can tell, the, the, the way that I've um, researched it, it's from uh, best-selling British author uh, Jeffrey Archer. And I heard this quote, and it goes like this. If you have talent and energy, in life you will always be a king or a queen. If you only have energy and no talent whatsoever, you will still in life be a prince or a princess. But if you have all the talent in the world and no energy, you will only ever be a pauper in life. So after hearing that, I knew that no matter what, I just had to keep my energy up as much as possible <laughs> and just cross my fingers. And so a few years later, I very slowly and emotionally typed the end. I had 85,000 words written of our stories, the stories of this area of London, Powell River, and Desolation Sound. And so now what? Well, now that it's written, you send out the manuscript. 
the, the, uh, the, the printed form of the book, and that's what I did. I sent it to Harbor Publishing, and uh, it's based on the Sunshine Coast, and uh, it's uh, been around for 40 years. They specialize in adventure, West Coast books, so I thought, hey, perfect. I waited for months and months. I never heard a thing. So I went to plan B, and I sent my manuscript out to every single publisher across Canada of this book, Adventures in Solitude. And within about a month, the rejection letters started coming in. Uh, the biggest complaint that I received was uh, the book was, and the stories were too regional. No one cares about some old hippie dude <laughs> named Russell Atoski who walked across the mountains. No one cares about a, a potluck you attended where everyone was naked. No one cares about a, 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 an obscure First Nations culture that lived in these saltwater waterways. And uh, Lund, excuse me, hello, what? I've never heard of the place. This is what people would say in these rejection letters. No one cared about these characters, and I was extremely disappointed. I was confused. I had already told, as I mentioned, I had already told the stories on CBC. They had done well. Weeks and months went, came, went by. The rejection letters kept on coming. I was despondent. And there were two uh, publishers that I was holding out on there named uh, McClellan and Stewart and Douglas and McIntyre. And coincidentally, they both sent me emails on the same day. And I remember uh, my wife and I sat down on the couch and we were, like, I was like so excited because this was it. This was the last two. Open up the emails as my wife and I sat on the couch, both rejections. So ladies and gentlemen, they said again the material was too regional too uninteresting, and too uninspiring. So I had been rejected by every single publisher in Canada. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So it was over, right? Well, screw that. I was defiant, and I was indignant by their response. I never gave up on it. Uh, particularly, I thought the stories of the counterculture movement in the 60s and 70s uh, were never properly told. Uh, there's a couple of my buddies up in Desert Eastern Sound. A lot of the stories in the book revolve around these two guys. And uh, I wanted to tell these stories. I thought the area was beautiful. There's a Pacific white-sided dolphin uh, swimming nearby our place. And uh, there's my wife, Jill, cruising through the sound. And me and my buddy, Rory, finding a little bit of the example of that counterculture that exists um, <laughs> up in Desolation Sound. And I thought to myself, with these complaints, I thought, wait a second, this is confusing me. The shipping news, a, a, a great international bestseller set in a tiny village in Newfoundland. Was that too regional? I mean, come on. Uh, uh, what about uh, Never Cry Wolf, one of my all-time favorite books, set in the Arctic tundra? Is this appealing only to Inuit? Obviously not. What about the beachcombers? <laughs> CBC's number one exported show of all time to over 80 countries around the world in its heyday. People in Saudi Arabia were staring at this <laughs> wonderland of mountains. And what was the premise of that show? Greek dude, First Nations buddy, collect logs. Uh, let's do it. 30 year, uh, 11 year history, it's their 40th anniversary this year. So that is what really inspired me, but still it was, it was, it was dead. It was my winter of discontent. But then, as uh, Shannon mentioned, I'm a beer league hockey goalie, and uh, one, of my, um, one of my pals that I play hockey with uh, said to me, so what's going on, you know, in the bar uh, after the game? I said, well, I've written a book that everyone hates, my finger is hovering above the delete key daily to just get rid of it out of my life. And he said, well, what's it about? And I tell him. And he said, well, have you ever sent it to Harbor Publishing? I said, yes, that's the first one I sent it to. I heard nothing. And he said, well, my dad owns Harbor Publishing. I said, oh, oh. well, I put in a word. Two weeks later, received an email from the legendary Howard White, the owner, and he said that he will publish Adventures in Solitude. Yes, thank you. <laughs>
And so it came to be. Adventures in Solitude, the story that no one wanted to read, came out in September of, uh, of 2010. There I am, very excited. My wife and I opened up the first copy right on that couch where we open up those rejection letters. And uh, I am happy to say that within a, a, about a month of the, the book's release, it was number one on the BC bestsellers list. It became a national bestseller. And uh, I, I included a lot of the photos that you've seen today in there. And uh, I, I, that, that, um, this photo here, uh, let's go back one. I, I put this one in. Forgot to tell Rory <laughs> that, uh, that I put that one in. And, and here's Rory seeing the photo for the first time in the BC Fairies gift shop. <laughs> uh, you know, he's a teacher. You know, I'm, he's, uh, he's head of the union. But, uh, but he has uh, also bought a cabin up in Desolation Sound, so now we're neighbors officially. Uh, the book was also uh, nominated for the uh, Hillary Weston Prize, the largest um, nonfiction prize in Canada. And oh, actually, and it also won the BC Book Prize of Book Year, so that was great. But this was the big national award, and my parents were thrilled that not only um, was I side by side with Charlotte Gill's book, Eating Dirt, uh, about the tree planting tribes, uh, but also my parents couldn't believe it that I was side by side with our first Prime Minister of Canada. <laughs> Sir John A. Macdonald, the stories nobody wanted to hear about London, Desolation, Sound, and Powell River right beside our first Prime Minister, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, didn't win the prize, but it was an absolute thrill. I think the book on Mordecai Richler won. And uh, so what I learned in this whole exercise, besides the perseverance, was that it, it wasn't really so much about the place. It was about the stories that were universal, that, that people could relate to. The stories of family and the stories of, of travel and, the, and uh, the stories of growing up. And sometimes I fear that uh, too many people, uh, the, the su success of the book will mean that too many people will find out about Desolation Sound and you know, what have I done? You know, I've, I've, I've ruined it. Uh, but, but then I remember um, that it's so important to share life's great experiences. And uh, that I think of uh, M. Wiley Blanchett, who wrote The Curve of Time. And uh, she was a single mom, and she uh, took her five kids and cruised our inner passage for summer after summer in the 20s and 30s. And thousands, if not millions, of people have read that. And uh, my book is, it takes place in many of the exact same places. And yet, even though there's the success of the curve of time and there's also the success of, of Adventures in Solitude, there are still days where my wife and I will be out there and we'll be, we will be out in our boat and we will see, we'll be on a, a rock somewhere and I'll say, look at this, Jill. There is not a living soul in any direction, anywhere. And unfortunately, right after I said that, the boat wouldn't start. <laughs> uh, so in closing... I am extremely proud, uh, proud of my a long connection to this area, proud of Powell River and Lund and Desolation Sound, and proud that I was right, that our stories are worth telling and that the idea is indeed worth spreading. One more photo to share from you from Monday. So uh, that is uh, a whale, uh, an orca, first one I've seen in 35 years of coming up here. And uh, it's in Oak Over Inlet, Easter Monday. My wife took the photo. And can anyone tell me what um, the whale's doing, what that move is called? Who said that? Oh, Charlotte. That's right. You've won a book of uh, Adventures in Solitude. Yes, it's called Spy Hopping. So thank you very much. My name is Grant Lawrence. Thank you so much for listening, and enjoy the rest of the day.